Okay, since we have the, the fall break coming up uh, for the next week, the um, and that means no lecture on Tuesday, we'll start on Thursday. I decided instead of jumping right into Hamiltonian um, mechanics, we go over a little more of the details of the Lagrangian. So a lot of this uh, stuff here is review, and each of this, uh, these will begin with just a brief review of what we did uh, in the last lecture. And I want to go over again uh, the uh, idea of building a manifold uh, for a mechanical thing. Well, this is one of the rare cases where you can actually very easily visualize the manifold because it's two-dimensional. You, you have a, a brain that's hooked up to do uh, two and three dimensions uh, fairly uh, uh, fairly well, certainly better than um, uh, four or five or six dimensions. And uh, we'll look at techniques for uh, doing those higher dimensions uh, later on. Don't don't mind the uh, uh, that would probably be a robo call for for my lab. I mean, what the heck? Uh, robots have to earn their money too, I guess. Anyway. Um, the main thing that uh, this will, the hard part of this will be uh, taking the Lagrangian calculation to its uh, completion and then um, second guessing. Now, the new kind of equation that we're going to be seeing today, but it won't have the full notation that goes with the covariant and contravariant calculus of, um, well, general relativity, but the um, the uh, picture on the uh, wall down there of the Riemann equations. This is the workhorse uh, for uh, GCC coordinates. There are two of them, the covariant and the contravariant Riemann equations. That's something that we'll treat uh, next week. But we'll be seeing the Riemann equations for this, and it's a really very simple idea uh, at this stage just a matter a matter of taking the inverse of the of the dynamical metric okay uh, let's go ahead and um, remind ourselves of what we're doing here uh, as far as physics goes this is uh, mechanics is associated with moving levers and getting kinetic energy into uh, one part in particular the projectile uh, lever and I mentioned that that if you play any sort of sports that involves a lever like golf or tennis or lacrosse or baseball, um, you can learn a, a, a better way to do those sports uh, by thinking about this. And that we'll get into uh, next week as well uh, as we take uh, simpler models of this thing uh, to a uh, task, as it were. But um, things that throw cars are pretty impressive, and that's why. Uh, this trebuchet has had a rebirth from its horrible role in the 12, 13, 1400s as a war machine of, uh, of some terror. Um, and I've mentioned that Galileo has nothing to do with this, but maybe he could have if science and warfare had been married as closely as they are uh, uh, nowadays. So, um, the uh, forces that are being dealt with here are numerous, but by doing the Lagrangian uh, uh, equation, uh, we uh, uh, can uh, uh, avoid thinking about uh, forces that are constraint forces. Now, we're just neglecting straight away the frictional forces. We'll try to take those into account at the very end but this um, science of the Lagrangian Hamiltonian is very much um, uh, fearful of the randomizing forces like friction. Uh, it's not uh, well designed to do that uh, uh, numerically, I should say, uh, conceptually and algebraically. But of course, uh, you, you can, you can uh, take the equation that we have where we have the external force exposed 
and we're just using the kinetic energy instead of the whole Lagrangian. We haven't bothered to make a potential for uh, this force yet. But if the force is frictional, you can't make a potential for it. So this is the equation that you would use uh, if there were uh, frictional forces. And you would put them in at this point. So um, I want you to be aware that uh, this really isn't the Lagrange equations that you see in, in most texts, but it's, this, it's right next door to it, and it's a powerful uh, a set that lets you ignore uh, all of the constraint forces that are running around here affecting uh, this complicated apparatus. And so as we do the uh, second guessing of the Lagrange equations that we finally get, uh, we'll uh, be uh, uh, seeks a little bit more of, of the mechanics, the raw mechanics of it. And of course, when you have a conservative force, it, it assumes the, that very beautiful form uh, there uh, with the uh, Lagrangian being the, the difference of the t t t kinetic energy and the potential. And you already know the Hamiltonian is the sum of those two things. So uh, that's, that's us. We'll take that up again. Uh, in the uh, next lecture a week from now. Okay, now, um, I already mentioned that these were double-valued right and left uh, configurations uh, for this machine as looking at it from this side. Now, obviously, you go around and look at the other side. That reverses uh, as uh, handedness is tend tends to do. But, uh, it's not too different from the way you really should handle the simple polar coordinates, single uh, object. <clears throat> and uh, the drawing of manifolds. Uh, first of all, the crude drawing in which you just simply take the generalized coordinates and let them be Cartesian. And uh, you saw s the, some of that in the exercises that in involved uh, the parabolic versus hyperbolic. That's a good lesson uh, there of being able to do that. Um, but it sure is nicer to uh, have some sort of thing that has the same topology uh, that is geometry plus global geometry uh, of the full mechanics. If this trebuchet is allowed to do all of the angles, cover all of the space it can, uh, then uh, you have the top and the bottom of the manifold as being the uh, right-handed. These are all right-handed positions uh, for the trebuchet. And then next door to that is the left-handed ones. And then the right-handed ones repeating again. So this is a multiply, mul um, <coughs> multiply covered uh, uh, manifold space. But the picture of it with the vectors that occur uh, in there, in this case the covariant vectors. We're going to go over this in some more detail than we did last time, uh, just to get uh, a feeling for, uh, more of a feeling for this weird GCC type uh, coordination. Um, and again, the idea is that the covariants uh, are the ones that come from the first differential of each of these uh, coordinates. So. Uh, if I'm going to assign a unit uh, to a, a small unit, say a hundredth, 0.01 uh, as my unit uh, of this uh, manifold, then uh, I will have something that's very close to the uh, parallelogram that makes up the unit cell for the lattice that is uh, covering the, this manifold. So this is just a blow up here of, you can see this thing's uh, cell, the cell that goes with uh, this particular guy right here is, you know, it's, you know a very funny shaped. Uh, when you follow the coordinates that go, it comes down to here, goes up to there, and then comes back and meets something uh, that's uh, right here, you see. So if you follow that cell, it's, it's covered. This, this, all of this right here, you see, I come out of that vector right there, meet the next one, well, say right here, go up to here, and then come back to, let's see if I have, I have to hit something that, I have to hit to this thing, I have to go all the way over and hit this thing, and then come in there, so there, 
there's the cell. That's the small, sort of the smallest cell. Uh, that it, and it's completely warped. It's not a nice a parallelogram at all. So the way to think about these things is in terms of ones that are small enough uh, to be um, well, they're not Cartesian because it's it's not uh, 90 degrees, but they're at least behaving like you're used to with unit vectors that go along the thing. That's the tangent space. The normal space, the one that involves the contours, we'll picture that uh, uh, again uh, later on here. Okay, is there anything else I need to say? Is this a better picture uh, of this? Um, <clears throat> and we'll be shifting coordinates so that we use sums and differences of these two coordinates. That's a contact transformation that we do when we get to the Hamiltonian description. But in any case, um, this is a blow up here where you see all of these uh, cells rather clearly and you know, how they're connected to each other. And again, this is right. Everything on top is a trebuchet that's shaped like that. And it, you see, and if I do that, I go over into the left-handed uh, trebuchet, you say. <clears throat> Makes sense so far? Is this a uh, reasonably uh, clear uh, description of this thing? Really, all are to, together. Here's a, uh, a nice right-handed position, so we're looking at the top of that. A torus, and here is a nice left-handed. We're looking at the bottom, uh, the left region of this uh, uh, torus. Okay. Now, whenever I do anything in mechanics, I always think, okay, what if I had a quantum trebuchet? Okay, wave function lives on that manifold, right? Has left and right parity. Okay, that's cool. That's not something we were worrying about in uh, 12 and 1300, though. They <laughs> were worried about getting hit by this thing. Okay, now um, the covariant, contravariant, and then Jacobian versus Kajobian, that's really uh, a key to all of this uh, uh, arithmetic. And we already uh, looked at this. Go ahead on this screen here so we have a clear picture. Uh, of this as we go along here. This comes out of page 43, lecture 9, remember, this was still in the review section. Okay. No problem there with funny shaped cells like this that we're dealing with now. All of the cells here that I would make, say, would be, you know, a millimeter this way and then a, a milli angstrom or something, a milli uh, radian uh, up this way, okay, so you're making little pie-shaped things uh, uh, here, but they all have right angles. That's the thing, it has right angles for the intersections everywhere except here. The center, the singularity, right? So, um, these two are the uh, actors, and uh, we'll get to be putting physics, remember I said that these things are more like what you uh, used for extensive variables, and these are more likely what you use for intensive variables. That's uh, um, sometimes a good thing to know. Okay, but it really is important to realize that delta r is partial of q1 with respect to distance. That's the uh, with respect to the coordinate q1. Uh, uh, that's the covariant guy, and then this is a partial with respect to Q2. Q2 isn't a denominator, Q2 is a quantra, quantra quantity, but when it shows up in the denominator, it makes it into a covariant quantity. And then you always have as many up indices as down when you're talking about something that is invariant to your choice of viewpoint. You want to make a new kind of coordinate system here? You just draw this, but it would be equal to this. You see, we'll make that point as we go along. Of course, that's the first differential that we're, we're talking about here. So, E1 has to follow the tangent to Q2 equal a constant. It's a partial derivative with respect to Q1. That means, by implicit definition of a partial derivative, that you're keeping all of the other independent variables, only one other here that's Q2, but that Q2 has to be a constant. 
since only Q1 is being uh, talked about as its very variation, well, all of these, if there were more dimensions, would remain constant. That's something I want to make sure that you uh, have firmly understanding. Then comes these other guys that do just the opposite. Okay. These other guys have vectors uh, unlike these that contra, they're, they're absolutely perpendicular to the gradient here. This is the E2, which is the gradient of Q2. Q2 equal a constant here has something pointing normal to it in the direction in which it's increasing. Okay, it's going from Q2 equal 200 on this curve to Q2 equal 201 on this curve. Okay, and then the same thing's true for this guy. He's contra uh, to this guy here. This Q1 equal a constant, say 100, okay, and perpendicular to that, the gradient of Q1 is what this is. That's the uh, old-fashioned Gibbs notation for the gradient. This is the more modern one. It's just the flip of this one, right? Okay, so call the normal space because the gradients are making up your your uh, basis for describing. Um, and I say this is, this is convenient for uh, intensive quantities like uh, force, okay, momentum, things that uh, uh, just involve that point, not don't involve a, a, a global extent of something, a volume or a surface area or something like that. Okay. Question. Yes. Like a so, the first covariant basis, E1 and E2 are the tangent vectors. So, this is the Q2 direction, right? So, Yeah, this one right here, for example? Yeah. Uh, what we're talking about is uh, E1 equal the, re the change in R due to changing Q1, right? So, uh, it's going to sneak along here, uh, keeping Q2 constant. Okay. But it is going to be changing Q1 from 100 to 101, right? And therefore, it is tangent to any of the other uh, lines, surfaces, hypersurfaces that might be in the problem. So it's going to be tangent to the other base? All of the others, okay. yeah. It's in, in some sense, right? I mean. Here it's very obvious a tangent to a line, but there could be a surface coming out of here, right? You'd be just as tangent to that, right? Is, it that, is that clear for everyone? So those are a uh, key thing. And then this stuff's just the opposite. And it sticks out. And so obviously with orthogonal coordinates, there's much difference between these, except for length. And if you do take most of those mathematical books that do OCC, they'll make them the same length. Which kind of defeats the purpose of, have, of having the dual space. Okay. But you can get away with it if it's orthogonal. All right. Um, and of course, they come together here, being orthonormal. Mutually orthonormal is the word that I like to use. Okay. All right, and that's a big convenience for calculations, um, as I hope we'll see here. Um, I want to review those two again with respect to the Jacobian. This is back in uh, lecture 14, uh, page 18, where we put together uh, the geometry of this thing. And I uh, had trouble with the little l that uh, is such a, a terrible um, causing such a terrible font war uh, for mathematical physicists that use these uh, things. In any case, here is the uh, Jacobian uh, for the, uh, the, 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 this uh, problem that we're doing here. Okay, uh, Just as, it, as we look at the uh, variation of this thing with respect to theta and phi, and we're talking about uh, uh, the x and the y, of the projectile, so this is a little bit uh, 
it's not a global thing. We haven't uh, added to this yet uh, the variation of the other project, the uh, thing that's driving us, the great big mass at the end of the, uh, of the butt end of the lever there that's going gravity through gravity is driving this thing. So, uh, thing to remember again is that once you make the Jacobian, and of course we have to be careful to make a Jacobian whose determinant is in singular or just zero, leaving out the variation of the important variables, and that's how we came upon the one in our case here. Uh, once you've done this, then uh, you look in the theta column here, and you've got E sub theta, the covariant. And you look in the phi column of this derivative, where the uh, GCC case, the theta and phi are in the denominator, uh, that's the E phi direct vector right there. So those are the, car as, as we were talking about, Bill, uh, we were just talking about this, there are your uh, Cartesian coordinates of this vector that's coming from this weird space. Okay. That's uh, the other uh, vector and its Cartesian coordinates too. So both of these are x and y components respectively. Right? Make sure that uh, you keep that in, in mind. So when you actually plot these things out, pick a theta, pick a phi, uh, they should be in the right place. And I'm going to go ahead and ask you to actually draw with a ruler and compass a a torus like this and put a couple of those vectors on it just to get uh, get your uh, feet wet on this uh, idea of the geometry and the physics. Then over here, uh, Kajobian transformation. Um, be sure and clear your cache of the previous lecture because the R was missing from transformation. A transformation, which sounds so, so sort of a, a weird. Uh, like we're going to give this thing a bath or something, but uh, uh, maybe it needs it. But in any case, this is just the opposite. Now the uh, GCC variables are upstairs and the Cartesian variables are downstairs. And, and uh, in order to get this matrix, I have to find the inverse of this one right here. It's easy to do. Uh, remembering your two by two inverse, what you do in that is you switch the diagonal components and then you put a minus sign on the off diagonals. It's pretty easy to remember that. And then, of course, have to divide by the determinant. And that's the rub right here. Is that makes us for extra algebra. Because this is what the Hamiltonian is going to use. Lagrangian doesn't use that. It uses the uh, raw Jacobian. This is using the Kajobian, which is just a little bit more complicated. Complicated spelled with a K. Okay, so the contravariant vectors versus the covariant. Um, again, uh, it's um, this one totally involving the L, just like this one totally involves the L, and this one right here, that's just like this one, okay, except for that factor. And then you can see when theta and phi get to be equal, that's when you start being in these regions right here or right here, the equator, the equator of this uh, torus looking thing uh, is where uh, this thing goes bananas, okay? The uh, Jacobian, in this case the Kajobian goes to infinity, the Jacobian goes to zero. So uh, your coordinates aren't very much use when they're right on top of each other. It's a, 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 like what happens at the contact surface. Remember all those parabolas that made a parabolic contact surface, right? Well, all those par para parabolas, to answer a question you asked about GCC, you could make those into a GCC, right? And then their Jacobian would go to zero or infinity right on the envelope. Okay? The other name for that uh, contact uh, terms in optics is called a caustic. If you shine light in a swimming pool, you'll see regions where the, they're very bright lines. Those are caustics. And all the waves there sort of pile up and turn around to go the other way, like these curvature uh, circles here are doing to make the uh, a manifold. So, 
um, make connections to other things with this stuff and you'll discover new things perhaps. So um, this is showing the contravariance and the covariance again. Um, if there aren't any questions I will go on here reminding you of course that the scalar products are either one or zero uh, between the blue and the green here between the covariance and contravariance. Okay, now we've got to uh, relate these two tensors, or matrices really. Uh, the covariant me 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 uh, metric tensor or matrix and the Jacobian. And uh, while we're at it, we'll be seeing that there's a similar relation between the contravariant metric and the uh, Kajobian. But th this one's probably the most important uh, for most of the work uh, that we do. Here we're going back to polar coordinate examples again, just to uh, uh, frame that a little bit. But um, the basic idea is, if you have the uh, scalar product of two covariant vectors, then you get a, a uh, called a tensor, if you want, but components of a tensor, a uh, metric matrix, uh, which most likely, if you're working with GCC has off-diagonal non-zero components. And the same thing is true for the inverse of that, which is this thing, okay, also off-diagonal. But if you put the two right next to each other, co and con, then you get this thing. Now, normally, I would have said that uh, the mathematicians would just call that G N up, M down. This one is G, M, N, N down, and this is G, M, N, N up. This one's sort of halfway in between. They use a different symbol for this. Why? Well, um, I can imagine them arguing about this and probably saying, hey, no, got, everybody's going to get screwed up enough on this thing. Let's use the old symbol for the Kronecker delta, which is a Greek D, and put the uh, indices in the right place. So you've got to make sure you put the indices in the right place because if you put them here, then it is the Kronecker and will be 1 and 0. This one is 1 or 0 depending on whether it's equal or not. And then the epsilon tensor is going to have to play this game too, but we'll get to that later. Okay, so uh, for polar coordinates, it's no big deal. The, all the off-diagonal components are zero, but not in our, uh, not with our trebuchet. Okay, this is what you're seeing uh, with a trebuchet. Okay, I make scalar products of the covariant with itself. Okay, well that that's pretty easy. That just comes out to be r squared. It's cosine squared sine so you can multiply by r squared. That's just, uh, simple. But this one right here, this one, when I put the two together, I get this guy, some of that. Well, th that's basically a sine of theta minus phi. So that's a quick way to write on here. Actually, I'm sorry, it's cosine of theta minus phi. And um, this thing is equal to it. So whatever you do, you know that scalar product commutes. These are not operators or anything fancy. It's just dot product. So this is equal to that. I'm just drawing it over uh, in state space here. That's what this is equal to. And then the, uh, this one down here is once again just L squared. So there's there's a, a typical example of covariant, non-trivial ex example of the covariant metric. And then this guy has got its um, uh, thing to go with it as well. This thing right here again. Uh, this one comes out with a, let's see if that's uh, right there, cosine, sine, <coughs> theta phi, cosine, cosine, sine, sine. This one is sine, sine, cosine. Uh, I'm wondering why I have a sine here and a cosine there. Something is a little bit wrong there. I don't know what is that. Uh, cosine, cosine, sine, sine is definitely uh, cosine theta minus phi. What, how did this one get to be? Oh, this cosine, but the determinant, the determinant of this thing uh, definitely has a, a, sine, uh, a sine squared theta minus phi. Uh, is that, so that's okay. 
remember the covariant doesn't have that, this one does. This metric has it just like these vectors all have that. Okay, uh, so far so good. Now, Jacobian, this, this guy up here, okay, if you do a Jacobian uh, and then you do a transpose of it, okay, and uh, uh, multiply uh, that, uh, you will get the metric. So the metric is a double Jacobian, so to speak. You have to transpose it in order to get the right numbers, but uh, that, that's a, a, a relation that we uh, um, love. And it's just based on uh, the scalar products uh, of this. You have to make that the scalar products in order to get the uh, Jacobian uh, matrix. Okay, um, the Jacobian product uh, also uh, would give you uh, the contravariant uh, metric. Now here, here is where I tried to, um, I, sh I shall just go jump ahead here uh, to the page that has it and I'll put it on the other screen. Let's get all this stuff up to date here. And put everything in there uh, that uh, is important. So the G's are, re, are, are, are giving you a length that is the scalar product of, say, E theta here uh, with itself would be its length squared, okay? And the actual length of that uh, vector is not unit. They are not, they're unitary vectors. That's the name that's given. It's completely wrong for both quantum mechanics and classical mechanics. But uh, to make them unit vectors, you have to divide by the length that they have. So this uh, vector here has uh, a length that's equal to uh, that, the square root of the metric coefficient, diagonal metric coefficient belonging to its variable. And then uh, the phi uh, uh, have, have a similar uh, 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 thing. This, the length of this thing is the square root of g, the covariant g phi phi. You come over here and the length of this thing is, is, is g phi phi also, but it's phi contra, up in the air. Different number entirely, sort of inverse to the number of that. As these guys uh, grow, these guys shrink, and they have to do that so that you get the scalar product to be an invariant to any uh, 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 choice of coordinates. And let's see if there's anything else. Um, well, the covariant projection, okay, for example, this number right here, you have a vector here, and that's the whole game here is to, to, to write these vectors uh, in terms of either covariant or contravariant for a given coordinate system. But somebody comes along with another GCC that's been labeled with little bars over the top of everything, a completely different coordinate system, not shown here, but it could be the Cartesian coordinates, but let's suppose it's a GCC, so it has all the pathologies of, of this one. Okay, well then, uh, what, what you uh, would be doing is, is, is a projection uh, of that vector onto a particular, say, E sub theta. Okay, so this thing projects along that line perpendicular uh, to uh, this line right here, which is a, a, uh, a, a <coughs> the E theta line, or it projects onto the E phi line, which is right there. Okay, so what is that length? What is that actual length uh, that the projection is? It's not just simply V super M. It's V super M, uh, let's see if you've got it right here. Uh, this is one way to write it. It's V sub theta time divided by G phi phi. You have to divide by the um, length of this vector. So basically what I would be doing, you see, 
to find this number is I would multiply both sides of this equation by e super, e super m. So e super m would come in scalar product of that guy, gives you a 1, and then I'd be left here with e super uh, in v, dot v. Okay. And that's why that's the way you calculate uh, these um, th these coefficients here. Basic idea of v dot e theta. Okay, the magnitude of that is v dot unit theta. Okay, and then the, the unit uh, theta is the vector e divided by its length. Okay, and so that gives you. Uh, this thing, this particular thing right here, is just v sub theta, and then this is a scale, extra scale factor you have to tack onto that to get the magnitude of that projection. And that's what you're really looking at at that line. Does that make sense? So th these are all uh, things that you'll have to do about a dozen times uh, to solve that one problem. That has them all crazy, right? I've got really crazy coordinates in there very different projective lengths and uh, this is the page to look at to see how to do that and it applies to this guy as well. The normal space and the tangent space uh, deserve respect and that's what we're uh, really talking about here. So we've been talking about length here, we have to talk about area and volume as well but um, once you get the length down you pretty well, pretty well have this under control. Okay, um, let's see if there's anything here that I need to say in addition. Yeah. Um, the, uh, I think I've lost a train of, of thought here. Um, what I'm doing is I'm saying EM here could be written as a contravariant component, the nth contravariant component of the vector uh, e super m, okay, and uh, that implies that this guy right here is the, the metric tensor. In other words, you write the uh, contravariant uh, vector e m as a sum of the uh, contravariant metric on uh, this the covariant uh, uh, vector. So um, you can just multiply both sides of that by uh, E sub M if you want to. That would uh, kill this thing right here and just give you uh, GM, GMN and then uh, that would be the component of, uh, that would be this thing, the nth, the contravariant nth component of the contravariant vector EM. So uh, this is kind of a confusing way. Uh, to look at the uh, projections of each other. Same thing uh, here. If you have a covariant metric and you have a contravariant vector, you turn it into a covariant vector uh, simply by summing. Remember, uh, we're summing over the repeated indices on one side of the equation. Dummy index rule we talked about before. Okay, uh, let's see if um, the coordinate transformations make uh, sense. So you, here I've got a contravariant vector uh, for a particular coordinate frame, queer coordinates Q1, Q2, and then I've got really queer coordinates, little bars on top of them, the barred frame. Completely different GCC, but both of them GCC. No orthogonality uh, anywhere. So here's where uh, you use what I call the chainsaw sum. This is the and in quantum mechanics, it's equivalent to applying the uh, completeness relation. Uh, I have a contravariant vector here, which is written as a Q contravariant, the queer coordinate, super M, contra, uh, is a, always the uh, literature choice for uh, uh, coordinates. And then uh, taking the partial respect to R, it's the, the uh, gradient of this uh, uh, function. And so I'm just going to slide the differentials apart from each other and then fill the empty spaces with whatever coordinate system I'm interrogating as to be uh, related uh, to this original one. 
So I have here a sum, and these are the repeated indices, this M matching that one and the R matching that. And uh, that's telling you right off the bat there, since um, this uh, thing right here is the, uh, shall we call it the Jacobian relation, either Jacobian or Kajobian at this point, because neither of them uh, has a, a, a Cartesian pedigree. But in any case, here's the uh, coefficient that I would be multiplying the contravariant unit vectors in D and summing over those. This would be the sum to get the nth uh, contravariant vector in terms of these. So that's a change in viewpoint. The idea being that uh, any vector that you write uh, has this viewpoint, if you like, contravariant uh, uh, components, this uh, view, if you like, to look at the covariant components in the unbarred coordinate system, and then there's the equivalent contravariant and covariant for the barred uh, things. This is just another view of the same vector. You have to think of these vectors as actual lab equipment sitting in your lab and uh, along comes some uh, a wave that's going to make a coordinate system to view them and then uh, maybe there's another wave that has a completely different shape to it that's going to also look at that. This is how you manage all that bookkeeping and it all is based on the duality, the fact that these vectors that have the contours make a Dirac delta or Kronecker deltas, ones and zeros in scalar products with uh, each other, mutually orthonormal. Same applies. I do a Shane saw sum and I get a transformation relation uh, for uh, the uh, uh, covariant uh, vectors from bar, bar to, I should say, from bar coordinates to unbarred. And obviously, you flip the, this thing and put it on the other side, and it would be the inverse to that relation. Same with that. Okay. And once you've done that, once you've done that, you now have the transformation relation for the actual components. Those are the things that you're going to be writing down and taking as data. So it's the same rule, you see. This is downstairs with an indice up. It's got to be matched with the same sort of thing on the, uh, 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 on the factor. This is downstairs. It's got to be matched. This whole thing is downstairs. It's going to be matched with this thing uh, upstairs. Just the opposite over here. Okay. What we have here is this guy matching that guy. This is contravariant. That's covariant. And we would be, we'll be summing uh, over that. Okay. I think that uh, makes sense. Okay. It, it, any uh, any questions about this? The basic idea for this is uh, to take a different viewpoint than Cartesian, but here we're taking different GCC viewpoints. Dr. Harvard? Yes. So I guess I'm trying to think each of these, uh, the covariant and contravariant vectors, has a matrix representation. So then, are the, in, in all cases, are those matrix elements effectively the Cartesian directions that you would write to, to draw this on the usual space we have? Like, like so, you, think, you can derive, yes. like, like in polar or in spherical, we have R hat, and you can write it as X, Y, and Z. Yes. So the, the, the R hat would be a matrix for each of those elements. But each element is still like an X, Y, or Z. Let's back you, off here. Diagram it. Just a, uh, a little bit here so we remind. Uh, where that would occur. What you're looking at is one of these, if you're looking at the covariants, mm -hmm. and these are X and Y, right? Right, and that's true for the contravariant as well? You bet. Okay. You bet. Yeah. The first Jacobian or the first Kajobian that you do uh, is named by whether you put the uh, Cartesian part upstairs, that's what we call Jacobian, or downstairs, that's what we call Kajokia, the inverse of Jacobian. Okay, They're both Cartesian, but uh, here we can call one the Jacobian, the other Kajobian with confidence, right? Mm -hmm. Now I go from Q to Q bar, mm -hmm. well, you name whatever you want, right? 
and the components that we're getting are uh, components that uh, would relate uh, to each of the separate coordinates, just as these are relating to a queer Q, that whatever trebuchet is giving us, and X and Y. Okay, so X and Y would disappear. Okay, so if you started with some queer coordinate and you went to another one, to be able to actually plot it, you would have to first make a grid based on the original queer coordinate. That's the big problem with relativity, general relativity. You have to throw the Cartesian away. This doesn't exist anymore. It's not there. It, you know, th this is, you might say, the, uh, what do they call it when you go from child to manhood? Uh, there's some name for doing that, okay? Well, this is a general relativistic, and womanhood, right? Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the general relativistic version of that, coming of age, okay? It's to be able to work with coordinate systems that have no Cartesian basis at all. Now, we'd like to change that because we could make quantum mechanical things that are sitting there being very Cartesian. Trouble is, I, I'm not going to be the one, first one to go and do that experiment with a black hole. Where, you know, who knows what's going on in that thing, right? And you're going to be part of it very shortly. And so, um, at that point, you have to say, my gosh, I don't, uh, I guess, yeah, my old idea of Cartesian coordinates is gone. But in more delicate experiments, it's still there. It's still there. Yeah. You mentioned um, delicate experiments. I sort of visualize, well, here is something happening in space, and it seems sort of congested in a certain area, where that's where all the action is happening. If you could transform and zoom in using your yeah. coordinates. Or you're seeing things that are fractions of protons, like our, our gravity wave measuring devices are measuring distances that are uh, 10 to the minus 17th of meter. And concentrate on that yeah. and then just phase the old system out. Uh, I'm coding for this on our web app and it, using the alpha transparency it really really works because you can start with your Cartesian and just swap them out. Or let them, them, let them the vanish time. continuously. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we, we've got to come up with some mind tricks in order to really understand what's going on in all of these weird experiments that are going on now. Yeah, yeah Brad. Do you have any good examples of Jacobian matrices other than these ones that correspond to change changes between well-known coordinate systems? Like this one is... For this is pretty not well-known, the trebuchet. Well, the polar coordinates... Yeah. Change of coordinates from Cartesian mm -hmm. to polar coordinates. I think no big deal. That. that one is orthonormal. Yes. This one is not, as you can see. Only uh, sort of on the very uh, top there do I see some nearly right angles. So there is a place, and I'll ask you to find that place, where the, uh, and I did that for uh, some coordinates that you <laughs> already have gotten for homework this week. They, they all have regions or I should say sets of lines upon which it is orthonormal. Then they have the singular lines too, where they're not, just, not orthogonal anymore, they're right on top of each other. You see, so th that's the edge of this, the caustic of this uh, manifold, uh, inside and outside, outer equator, inner equator. So, some of what you're maybe asking about comes with this coordinate system. It's a torus, a weird torus. Well, you have two flavors of parabolic two-dimensional right. coordinates. So, yeah, in the future, the plop can, parabolas and the sliding parabolas, right? Yeah, those are perfect. Yeah. I, I mean, they were kind of just I just pulled them out of thin air to make a problem, and you know, it's it shows the power of the of of, of this. But they're all sitting in a Cartesian frame, right? The physics of a black hole is what Cartesian frame? Bye-bye. Uh, it's, it's like you leave mother now. You, <laughs> you're, you're on your own. <laughs> and you just have cues. That's all you've got. The queer coordinates, all you've got. 
Now maybe we get quantum mechanics and gravity together a little bit, we can, you know, make this better, but right now we're stuck with it. Okay, tangent normal space, I think I've already uh, done that, the, 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 these little parallelograms here, I think are all, uh, I think this is just talking about length again. Uh, I don't think I need to do anything more with that just at the moment. Uh, here, another example of transformation. Um, I don't think there's anything uh, particularly new. This one just saying it implies the same type of uh, algebra. But um, don't forget the other dual space that we use without thinking about it anymore is Dirac's duality of bras and kets. He wrote a whole textbook in which he didn't have this notation. Whenever he wanted a bra, he'd call it alpha. And whenever he wanted a ket, he called it beta. And my old mentor, John Smith, who lived through World War II, being a graduate student in physics in Leiden, which was a free zone, so you could walk around uh, pretty safely without getting transcripted into the German army and sent to the Russian front, which a lot of his friends happened to. But he uh, uh, read Dirac's original book to learn his quantum mechanics. And the original book was just filled with alphas and betas. You couldn't take the book out of the Leiden Library, and that was verboten, but uh, you could copy it. And he did. He copied the whole damn book, and he showed me this I think it was about this thick by the time you copied it, because he had to write alpha, beta, alpha, alpha, beta, beta, alpha, alpha, and the paper was literally wrinkled because of all the alphas and betas. <laughs> he, that's the way he learned his quantum mechanics. Boy, did he learn it. He did some really amazing stuff in solid state physics. It involves magnetism. Okay, so anyway, that's that. Anyway, the metric relations, uh, these relations right here don't exist for rockets, at least in, a, in the way we normally do uh, quantum mechanics. But um, it's such an elegant notation. Here's a chainsaw sum going on right here. This little trick right here is going on right here to get us between uh, these two uh, kinds of, uh, of vectors, the bras and the kits, the covariance and the contravariance. Okay. So these are all Dirac equivalents, uh, which you could use, but I wouldn't recommend it because there's a lot of writing for just writing the lines that go with the bras and kits that you avoid by doing that. Okay, let's see if there's anything else here. Yes, um, <clears throat> we're talking about uh, how much area does one of these things have. So with the two dimensions I can get that pretty easily with a cross product, which uh, is, a, is a length here. In other words, I can take the dot product of the cross product, square root it, but I recognize with the, the A, B, C, D product identity that it's this. We'll do more elegantly that with the epsilon tensor. This is uh, getting at determinants right now. Uh, and that's what you need in order to describe area. So this is, as you can see, when we uh, put this, uh, uh, all those scalar products uh, with their metric uh, values, uh, this is G11. 